few weeks is relating going back to school, our walk with our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And today, the idea that we are looking at is this idea that by the time you are a senior or by the time you gradu- graduate, hopefully, hopefully, you are equipped for that next phase of life. You're, you're ready for that next season of life. And that could be going on for further education. That could be entering the work field. Maybe that's traveling. My wife and I, we have some friends who's uh, one of their sons is a recent graduate, and he just completed the Trans-America bike route from the coast of Oregon to the coast of Virginia. He and a buddy averaged 75 to 100 miles a day on their bikes. Bicycles, not motorcycles, bicycles. Altogether, they rode about 4,200 miles. Took them about a month and a half. But of all the people I know, of all the the people that I think would complete that and love doing it and have an adventure doing it, it would be this particular person. Because he and his brothers and sisters, they were raised to be adventurous. They were raised to be smart. They were raised to live their dreams and not to be passive. It's just kind of how they were brought up. Their parents a few years ago actually, actually left all of their earthly possessions here in America and went and were missionaries in Africa for three years. Left a job as an engineer to, to go and follow that calling, to be, to be adventurous, to live the calling that God was given to them. And I think about our lives as Christians, and I think that God wants us to live adventurous lives. God wants us to live passionate lives. God wants us to have a dream and to fulfill it. Are you living your adventure? Are you living, are you living your dream? You know, I think in order to do that, we must constantly be alert to what not only is God telling us, but using the tools that God is giving us to grow and to mature, and to be the people he has called us to be. But that is, a, that is a lifetime of learning. That is a lifetime of experience. I think as Christians, we, we never really, we never really should graduate. There's always something new to learn. There's always a new experience. There's always a new phase of life. And through it all, God is teaching us. God is leading us to have this adventure, to have this passion to have these dreams so that we just don't sit on the sidelines, but we get up and and we're in the game. I want to read to you from from the book of Hebrews. This is the fifth chapter, verses 7 through 14. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son though he was, he learned. He learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him and was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. We have much to say about this, but it is hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk being still an infant is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. You know, at the very heart of this text is this idea that God wants us to be mature Christians. He doesn't want us to remain infants. He doesn't want us to remain babies. He wants us to become mature Christians. And what does a mature Christian look like? Well, the author of Hebrews offers up two images. The first is an image of a person, a Christian, who is able to teach others the elementary truths of our faith. So that's one requirement of being a mature Christian. You can share the elementary truths of your faith. 
Secondly, our text tells us that a mature Christian is someone who will be able to distinguish good from evil. Now let's unpack both of those a little bit. First of all, a mature Christian is able to teach the fundamental truths of Christianity. Now nowhere does this say you have to be a professor, you don't need to be a a professor of theology. It doesn't even say you have to be a Sunday school teacher. It just says you have to be proficient. You have to be able to teach the fundamental truths, the fundamental beliefs of Christianity. Now what are those fundamental truths? Well, the text goes on and we pick up in verse or in chapter 6 of Hebrews with the first two verses. The author says, "Therefore let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation." So this is stuff you should already know. We shouldn't have to reteach you. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death. We need to be able to to teach others about the repentance of sin and our need to do that. Secondly, and of faith in God. We need to be able to, to talk and discuss what it means to have faith in God. Instruction about baptism. The laying on of hands. The resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. Those are the elementary truths, beliefs of Christianity. Now, as I was reading that list to you, maybe, maybe not, you looked at one of those and maybe you wanted to scratch your head (laughs) and say, well, I'm not sure I could talk much about that. Well, if that's the case, and if we're told these are the things we need to know to be mature Christians, that we need to be able to teach these to our family, to our friends, to our coworkers, to our neighbors, then come and see me. I'd love to talk to you about any of these things. Or, or in our world today, do, do one of the things I, I love doing. Google it, right? Google's great. Or go to the United Methodist Church's website, UMC, United Methodist Church, umc.org. Go to that tab that says Our Beliefs, and it's all there. To make sure that it was all there, I even uh, searched on the United Methodist Church's website, uh, laying, laying on of hands, and guess what? It's even there. If you want to know what we believe as a church about laying on of hands, go to the website, umc.org. There is no reason in the world any of us should not be able to teach these elementary truths. I mean, we have all of this, all of these tools at our disposal. We have the internet. You have a church. You have Bible studies. You have books. We need to be able to teach these, these elementary truths, every single one of us, if we're going to be a mature, a mature Christian. Second of all, mature Christians should be able to differentiate between good and evil. Now this might sound easy, right? As Christians, shouldn't we be able to tell what's good, what's bad? But maybe it's just me. But it seems like we live in a world that it's becoming harder and harder to tell. Because it seems as if we, in this culture will all, almost rationalize anything so that we begin to believe, regardless of what the Bible teaches, regardless of what Christian tradition teaches, we almost believe what we're doing, even though we know it's wrong, we almost start to believe it's not that bad. We rationalize the bad behavior and tell ourselves, well, well, it's, it's okay in our situation. It's okay in our context. Those those people in the Bible, they they didn't know what we would face today. So we rationalize in our own minds that which is bad, but we continue to do it anyway. We get uh, get Reader's Digest at home, and and, I was reading an article a couple years ago about academic cheating. And they were talking about universities. They were talking about colleges. And how there are companies that you can pay to write your papers for you. They're actually interviewing a a guy who worked for one of these companies, didn't give his name. He said for a substantial fee, it's not cheap, (laughs) but for a substantial fee they would custom, custom write a paper for your field of study. They have about 50 employees all writing papers for someone else. 
And in this interview, this is, this is what this, uh, this ghost writer said. He said, in the past year, I've written roughly 5,000 pages of scholarly literature, most on very tight deadlines. But you won't find my name on a single paper. I've written toward a master's degree in cognitive psychology, a PhD in sociology, and a handful of postgraduate credits in international diplomacy. I've worked on bachelor's degrees in hospitality, business administration, and accounting. I do a lot of work for seminary students. He goes on, he says, I like seminary students. They seem so blissfully unaware of the inherent contradiction and paying someone to help them cheat in courses that are largely about walking in the light of God and providing an ethical model for others to follow. I've completed 12 graduate theses of 50 pages or more, all for someone else. Now, what's really interesting is that he goes on, and he actually says he's convinced himself that what he's doing really isn't wrong. He says, you know what? Our universities, our colleges are letting down their students. And so I just want to help. I just want to help them along in their particular field of study. Since the colleges aren't helping, I just want to help. I mean, he has rationalized cheating. And so have everyone who's paid to have one of their papers written by them, including all those seminary students. But it's just not cheating that we rationalize away, right? We rationalize away a lot of bad behavior. I mean, we, we, try, to, we try to kick a bad habit, but then we convince ourselves, you know what? I can't help it. I was made this way. Nothing I can do. Or maybe it's gossip, right? But everyone's gossiping. Everyone's doing it. Or sexual impurity. We say, you know, in our culture today, it's, it's just too hard to, to be sexually pure, whether it's in marriage or out. How could any of us expect us to be pure in this culture? It's too hard. Or, or maybe, I don't know, you, you lie on your taxes a little bit. And you convince yourself, well, it's not hurting anybody. I mean, the IRS is cheating us anyway, right? It's not hurting anybody. So we make all these excuses, even though the Bible might tell us otherwise, even though our conscience might tell us otherwise, even though Christian tradition tells us what's good and bad. We, we rationalize all these things. We say things like, well, that's who I am. Everybody else is doing it. It's too hard. I'm not hurting anybody. And so we become a little conflicted in our own minds. But the author of Hebrews tells us, if you want to be a mature Christian, you should be able to distinguish between what is bad and what is good. Between what is good and what is evil. Well, how do we do that? Now, let me tell you, I, I'm not suggesting it's easy. As a matter of fact, I think it's hard. In our text this morning, in verse 14 of uh, chapter 5, it says, But solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. You see, you've got to train yourself to distinguish between good and evil. You see, you're not born that way. I mean, we are born selfish, right? I mean, when you are born, it's all about you. People feed me. People, you know, change my diapers. If I'm not having a good day, I'm going to throw a, a temper tantrum. I mean, when we are born, we are born selfish. And unfortunately, that, does, that, that idea of selfishness does not go away easily. It just changes a little bit to different things in life. So we have to train ourselves to distinguish between good and evil. It's not easy. So... So how do we, you know, I, I think about school, and in school, you know, when, I, when I'm studying, when I'm training myself in school, it comes down a lot of times, to me at least, I, I'm, I tell my kids all this too, but, but flashcards in school, field trips, and study partners. Well, I want to suggest in Christianity, we need flashcards, field trips, and study partners. First of all, flashcards. Now, I said this uh, in first service, and afterwards, someone said, you know, 
I really liked your message, especially how we're supposed to leave the church and flash people. It's not quite what I said. First of all, we need flashcards. Again, I, tell, I, I preach this all the time to my kids. They don't want to use flashcards. But did you, who used flashcards? The index cards, you know? I was a big flashcard person. But the idea is that you're putting to memory something that you're going to utilize later. And for us, what we need to be putting to memory is the Word of God. You know, oftentimes what we do is we fall into sin or we decide to do a bad action and then we go to the Bible. Well, how great would it be if we knew the Bible so that before we fell into the temptation, the Word of God was there to protect us? All of us need to be memorizing Scripture. So I have a challenge for you. Go buy some index cards at Walmart. And for the next 52 weeks, write down one verse per week. Typically a verse in Scripture is about a sentence long. I mean, we all can do that, right? We need to hide God's Word in our hearts so we can differentiate between bad and good, between, between evil and good. So Google, Bible and maybe whatever issues you're having. Scripture, whatever issues that you struggle with. Scripture and, and some ways that you can be strong in the Lord. Find some verses you want to memorize. And again, one verse a week for the next 52 weeks. Get yourself some flashcards, some index cards, and put to memory God's Word. It's how we train. And if we aren't constantly training, we're going to fall. Second of all, we need field trips, right? Some of the best times to learn is, is getting away from the, the school building and going somewhere else on a field trip. Well, for us as Christians, we need to leave these church walls and we need to serve in the name of Jesus. We need to serve our community, we need to serve our families, we need to serve our schools, our workplaces. Serve in the name of Jesus. I know a guy who works at a factory and, and oftentimes factories aren't necessarily bastions of Christianity. But everybody there knows that he's a Christian. So when they go through a hard time, they go to him. And in private, they ask him to pray for that situation. How great is that? Serve, it, but just don't serve. Serve in the name of Jesus Christ. And the Bible tells us that when you walk in the light of Jesus, the darkness will disappear. Or in our context, when you walk in the light of Jesus, you'll be able to differentiate, to tell between, between evil and good. And then finally, a study partner. We all need study partners. A group that we can study with, a, a Bible study, an accountability partner, a Sunday school class. We learn much better with others. Even Jesus needed a study partner. Of course, his was his heavenly father. But our text tells us, during the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son though he was, even though he was the son of God, he learned. He learned obedience from what he suffered. If Jesus needed to learn, how much more so do we? But the good news is the more you learn, the more you are equipped, the more you will live out the adventure, the passion the dreams that God has laid upon your hearts. And so I ask you again, are you living your adventure? Are you living your passion? Are you living your dream? If not, this day is a great day to start being a lifelong learner in the Lord. Would you please pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace, for your love, and for your mercy. We thank you for your example that you gave to us through your Son, that even though he was your Son, he still learned. That, that human part of him, he learned. And dear God, we need to learn, we need to grow, we need to be mature, and so help us. Help us to know and to be able to teach those basic tenets of our faith. Help us to be able to differentiate between good and evil, so that we might be the light of Christ to those around us. But God, just bless us here this morning. We thank you for your faithfulness. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you please stand with me as we join together in our closing song.